Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 210, The Unique Hamlet. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a stronger. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your home's the meddler. Home's the busybody. Home's the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. And Burt. Uh, you're you're probably one of the most unique fellows I know. What what are you doing to to verify that uniqueness this time around? Absolutely nothing. I'm simply it's simply another ordinary day in February for me. So I'm sitting here in my white tie and tails with my patent leather shoes. Actually, I wish you could see this on the camera. I've got lavender spats Ooh. on and. Um, Earlier, I was polishing my mahogany cane. And, of course, for those people who know me well, that means only one thing. I'm getting ready to go out and shovel my front walk from the snow. <laughs> well, I hope you're not too surprised by what you find out, uh, find when you get out there. Because, as you know, when you raise your eyebrows in surprise, then the monocle simply falls uh, flat out. So. <laughs> Well, that's why I have the Peter Whimsy official monocle cord <laughs> yes. around around my neck. Oh, what you need is the Sherlock Holmes brand monocle cord. <laughs> now, sure. there's a question: Did did Holmes ever encounter? This is for trifles, I suppose. Did who who did Holmes encounter, if anyone, who was wearing a monocle? We'll have to look in the good old index. Oh, that's interesting. I we we came across Ponsnay a number of times. Mm. Yeah, um, but I don't recall a monocle. Although, if if anyone had a monocle, it would seem to me that it would be Lord Robertson Simon from yes. the uh, the Noble Bachelor. He seems the most likely suspect for wearing a monocle. Oh, I've got it! I've got it! Uh, Colonel Ross in Silver Blaze. Oh he, yes, did he have a monocle? Well, he did in the Granada production. Um, oh, that's right. <laughs> I don't that's remember. Right. I, I seem to recall the Paget illustration having one. I don't recall off the top of my head if that's factual. But, again, it seems uh, like it would be consistent with what I know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I love – I I have a monocle. I've, and um, I used to love to take it. I would still take it to Speckled Band meetings because it's lovely to put it in your of course if you're wearing glasses uh it's always difficult to use your monocle <laughs> uh, but well, you could put it in your eye and scan it i use it as a reading glass and you can you know scan mm. a menu with it and do things was it like was that. it a prescription had, one yeah i had my prescript my reading prescription in it mm. um I still have it somewhere. I just yeah, haven't used about it that. in a very long time because my wife, if I ever, if I ever took, brought that with me to a restaurant and used it to look at the menu, I'd be sitting alone probably. Yeah. It's funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yes, Colonel Ross in Silver Blaze, um, did have a monocle as I'm looking at the pageant illustration of him greeting Holmes and Watson at the railway station. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Top hat, monocle, spats, the whole nine yards. 
Yeah. I always envied Ian Carmichael, the actor, because he could keep a rimless monocle, just a, just a round pane of glass in his eye when he did Lord Peter Whimsey. And that's very difficult. I've never been able to do that. I have to have, you know, the rimmed monocle. Yeah. Well, when I was young, uh, I know this will come as no surprise to, uh, to you or our listeners. Uh, I had a Charlie McCarthy ventriloquist dummy and he had, he came with his own little felt top hat and a monocle and yes. he had, he had ridges carved uh, above and below his eye mm-hmm. that the monocle would just slide into. So maybe that's what you need to do, Bert, is uh, get some surgery, uh, get a ridge, <laughs> you know, kind of bur- bur- burrowed into your, uh, your, your, your lower brow there and, uh, and, and, and maintain your monocle. See, now this is a whole other episode, a whole other conversation. But when I was a kid, I was a ventriloquist and I still have my father's uncle was an entertainer and he sent me a wonderful figure that I still have made by an Englishman named uh, Len Insull and um, with a bunch of movements. And, and uh, you know, we could talk about vent figures now as a whole other hmm. other area for a while. Hmm. Well, and because of such youthful application to the practice of ventriloquism, this is why Bert and I now do an audio podcast. So <laughs> you can enjoy our ventriloquism and not notice that our lips are moving. It's This is exactly why Edgar Bergen got into radio with Charlie yes. McCarthy. And when you, when you yes. think about it now, that was probably the most ridiculous idea in the history of radio, we're going to do ventriloquism, but we're going to do it on the radio. <laughs> yeah, but look at the success of it because it was such a great character. <laughs> but what our listeners don't know is, as we do this podcast, the amazing thing, the truly amazing thing, is every time you're speaking, my lips are not moving. <laughs> thank, thank thank, goodness for that. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Well, and the, the more astute, uh, listeners among us uh, will know that uh, there is a connection between Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes to that. I'm not going to give it away here in the show. You actually have to go and check out the show notes for the link between Charlie McCarthy, Edgar Bergen, and Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, well spotted. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the meantime, if you would like to find those show notes, you can find them at ihose.co slash ihose210. That's all lowercase. Uh, that will take you to the ihereofsherlock.com site, specifically to this show's episode, uh, this, this show's notes. Uh, there you will find links. You will find uh, things related to our discussion today, including past episodes that you're going to hear mentioned, uh, and lots of other things related to the unique Hamlet. You can find us on the socials as I Hear of Sherlock. We are uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all as I Hear of Sherlock. We do appreciate you following us there. And even more importantly, we hope you'll hit the subscribe button on whatever podcasting medium you're listening to us on. And if that doesn't work for you, get an email update from us for free. Every time we post something to the site, you get an email notifying you of what's happened or you can just get the weekly digest because we're flexible like that so head on over to i hear of sherlock.com and poke around a little bit if you want to support the show we do appreciate that as well on patreon or paypal there are buttons on our website to do that for as little as a dollar a month it helps us do the research and uh, produce the show and everything related to it and bringing it to you on a bi-monthly basis the idea of a Christmas annual is nothing new. Why, that's exactly how Sherlock Holmes got his start in Beatons in 1887, the Beatons Christmas Annual. It's something that was resurrected in the early 1950s by James Montgomery, known as the Red Circle in the BSI. Every Christmas, he put out his own version of a Christmas annual, and they varied in length and in style, but it started a tradition. And then, 64 years ago, Edgar W. Smith began the tradition officially of producing the Baker Street Journal Christmas annual. 
It's appropriate that the inaugural 1956 issue featured Vincent Sterrett's monologue in Baker Street. Smith continued to publish the yearly Christmas annual until his untimely death in September 1960. And then after a 38-year gap, the BSJ editor in 1998, Don Pollock, resurrected it. And our current BSJ editor, Steve Rothman, continued the tradition with 20 issues. The 2020 Christmas Annual was edited by Richard Sviem, who is Dr. Hill Barton in the BSI. He graduated from St. Olaf College and the University of Minnesota Medical School. He was a resident physician at the University of Wisconsin and a fellow at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Bethesda. He retired after 33 years in practice of allergy and immunology at the Park Nicolette Clinic, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. And adjunct prof- he's an adjunct professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. He was president of the Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collections at the University of Minnesota for 20 years. And he's on the board of the Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota. Dick is a book collector and a member of the Grolier Club of New York City, and has authored Sherlockian articles for the Baker Street Journal and the BSI Press for many years. Dick, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you. Well, why don't we begin asking you the obvious question. How did you first get acquainted with Sherlock Holmes? Well, uh, like most folks, I was half a boy and half a man. My grandfather, Olaf Sviam, had a uh, copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles at his house. And I always saw that. Uh, When I was about 11, I went to the public library in Minneapolis, which was about a block from my house. I would read a lot of books. I mean, I would check out three at a time, bring them home, read them, turn around, go get three more. But I checked out the Doubleday edition of Sherlock Holmes and... You know, like most kids my age, I had trouble with some of the bigger words, but I managed to sort of get through it and I was very excited about it. And then, of course, at that era, 1964, uh, here in Minneapolis, we had matinee movie that used to show the old Basil Rathbone movies. And it was, you know, love at first sight. I always liked it. When I got my first paycheck is when I went out and actually bought uh, the Bering Gould two-volume green covered edition. So I moved from that as an avid reader to more of a Sherlockian where I, there was, I understood there was scholarship involved. Hmm. And, you know, as we record this, we've, we've got a video on and can't help but notice the wonderful stacks behind you. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about the, the collecting bug and how that bit you and, and where it's led you. Well, um, you know, I've always had sort of a reverence for books. I came at it from a reader standpoint, but started to accumulate. And I went through comic books and stamps and everything else. So I had the collecting gene. When I started to do books, I started uh, probably in college. Uh, I never actually entered any of the college book collecting contests, but I was always a- acquiring books. You know, I remember my first, uh, well, the scholastic books in school, then my first $10 book, my first $100 book, my first $1,000 book. It just kind of went crazy. Um, my income afforded me to be a, quite an avid collector. And from the Shalakian standpoint, it was, it was really when I moved back to Minneapolis after finishing my training. So I was started in Minnesota. I spent uh, undergrad and med school in Minnesota. I did residency training in Wisconsin, which is where I picked up the Baron Gould. And then I spent three years in Washington, D.C., uh, I was actually at the National Institute of Health, which is kind of amusing because I was in Tony Fauci's lab. And uh, amazingly, he's still working and I'm retired, so I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> um, but I uh, came back to Minnesota in 1986, and that's when it really got crazy. Um, I My clinic was near a bookstore, so I managed to stop once a week. I lived near a, a regional library that had a book sale room attached to it and just sort of kind of accumulated. And... Uh, in 2012, we downsized from a big suburban sprawl where we raised our four kids to a, a nice little 2,500 square foot house. But we built it with 950 linear feet of shelving, and I added another 856 linear feet of shelving. So I got about 40,000 books. So it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Only about maybe 
six or 7,000 are Sherlockian. I collect in many different areas. It's kind of a, once, once you sort of collect an area and you've sort of, it's ex, sort of exhausted, then you sort of fall into another rabbit hole and keep going. What's, what's your, if somebody were to ask you, what's your major collecting area? What would you say? Well, so, uh, you know, so I, I belong to all these bibliophilic societies and one of the big ones I belong to is the Groyer Club in New York City. Uh, uh, as a lot of Sherlockians uh, are following in the path of Glenn Maranker and Kostorosakis, but uh, uh, of course, George Fletcher. But, um, you know, I tell everybody I'm a, Sherlock, a Sherlockian and I collect oil and you know, I have manuscripts and I have other things that I've in my retirement I'm supposed to be working on. But so what's you know, what's things. the second tier? What's what's the rest of well, you know, I got PG Woodhouse. I have I have a lot of Rex Stout. I have you know, so a, a lot of mystery Victorian. But you know, I collect Gore Vidal. I collect you know Minnesota related items. I'm a Norwegian, so I have huge amount of Norwegian authors and the Norwegian immigrant experience. Uh, the Norwegian American Historical Association, the Norwegian American Genealogic thing. I mean, I just anything. I I, I make it a, a sort of a rule never to leave a bookstore unless I bought a book because <laughs> you walk around the bookstore until something speaks to you, and then you find new areas, and it's always interesting. Um, I was very excited this past year, uh, Jennifer. We were in in um, London after a Royer Club event in uh, Cambridge. And we, we found the Haywood Hill Library where Nancy Mitford worked and there's all this. And, and she signed me up so I get a book a month from the Haywood Hill. And, you know, it's always new English authors I haven't heard of. So I fall into another hole. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, having grown up a block from a library, having had your first clinic, uh, you know, across the street from a bookstore, um, th- this seems to plant you in the same kind of territory as Vincent Sterrett, whose autobiography was born in a bookshop. So yeah. um, how appropriate then that that should be the topic of or, or he should be the author of the topic of the Christmas annual for 2020. Uh, and of course, the, the, the topic is the 100 year adventure of the unique Hamlet. This was part of the subscription. If you weren't. Uh, if you weren't a subscriber of the Baker Street Journal in 2020, then you missed out on this opportunity to get this fine Christmas annual. And you know what? Stay tuned after the interview because we may have, we may have an extra copy lying around that we're looking to give away. So stay tuned for how we'll do that. In the meantime, Dick, uh, help us understand, uh, you know, why this topic and why now? Well, so we talked about my Sherlockian collecting. One of the f- first um, book lists I found uh, was John Bennett Shaw's Shaw 100. I had, J- Shaw had come to Minnesota where he ended up, his collection resides. And uh, he said, you know, if you're going to have a basic home museum library, you have to have these 100 books. And on that list was uh, The Unique Hamlet. Um, you know, so I was always trying to get the 100. And it was a question of, did I have the unique Hamlet or not? As you know, it was appended to the end of the private life of Sherlock Holmes when the University of Chicago published it in 1960. And then we came out in the paperback with the Michael Murphy introduction. So I had read it early on. I found it intriguing. Uh, as I, again, became more bold and had more resources, I actually got a copy of the actual book and then got a second copy. And then I realized that there was a mystery within it, which was that there was, uh, for the friends of Walter Hill and for the friends of Vincent Sterrett, which made it not only a valuable collectible, but it had a unique property that makes the, you know, the, all your collecting juices flow. And so I was up and running. Then I tried to convince everybody else in the world. Um, in 2009, I was able to convince Randall Stock that he ought to have a census of where these books are because these are really important books. And so, you know, he started keeping it up on the best of Sherlock, which is an excellent site. And he's done a yeoman work and discovered where all the copies were. And we were trying to answer the question, which is how many were printed? Uh, the, you know, the, the story is, as you read the annual, that there was supposed to be probably a hundred Hill copies and a hundred Sterrett copies. And turned out there was probably only 10 Sterrett copies and then who had those 10 and were those more desirable than the Hill copies? And so it's, uh, it was kind of fun. What got it to be in this particular year was that it was the 100th anniversary. So 1920 coming on to 2020 had to celebrate it. 
And all these connections, you know, I love connections and the connections were, you know, by God, the, the, um, the Baker Street Journal has a Christmas annual, which means that sort of like, well, a lot of things, Christmas annual, Beaton's Christmas annual. And then, you know, that, that people do Christmas books and this is a Christmas book. So it has that whole history to it. And it just all came together. Um, we were also in uh, Merrigan, Switzerland with the Reichenbach Irregulars and Michael Meir was there. And Michael Meir was telling the story about his copy, which in the annals of things has to be the most desirable copy because it was inscribed by Vincent Sterrett to Arthur Conan Doyle. And Arthur Conan Doyle had it in his collection. And through Adrian, it ended up in Switzerland. And that's how Michael got it. And that's the great closing chapter of this Christmas annual. Wow. That's incredible. Um, so, so take us through how you approached what to include in this annual. I mean, it's, it's a title that I think most Sherlockians are familiar with, but in your estimation, have most Sherlockians read it? Uh, is, is there that well, level of familiarity with it? Probably not. And that's why we made the editorial decision to include the text of the story in the Christmas annual in case one hadn't read it. That's the first chapter. So we have Vincent Sterrett's. Now, there is another interesting story because uh, having owned its uh, in a long having owned this book and in many different guises. So this story shows up in uh, many places. Um we started looking into the text, and lo and behold, there's textual variations between the 1920, when he included it in his anthology, he changed it again for the 1960, and this is where we have to credit Randall Stock with then taking on the charge, and with his computers behind him, he was able to show out all the textual variations in each time, and it really gets to the heart of Vincent Sterrett, the writer, which is, you know, he he never stopped tinkering with things. He wrote it. And then he changed it again, and then he changed it again. And every time he was going to put it in a print, you know, he had to go through it again and make some changes. So, you know, if if you're if you're a Sherlockian and you like this text and you're really into it, this is perfect. Yeah, Dick. Um, you know, you, we've already covered a lot of interesting ground here, particularly Christmas annuals and the name of the publisher and so on. For our listeners who might not understand the mechanics of the unique Hamlet, just in a sentence or two, could you place it for them? You know, the year, how it surfaced, who the printer was, um, how it came about. Sure. So uh, the story is that Vincent Sterrett, a 34 year old ex journalist. So he was writing for the newspapers, tried to go out on his own to be a writer, a penny a line kind of writer in the, uh, in the 1920s. He was also a book collector at that time and knew Walter Hill and had wrote the introduction to several Walter Hill book catalogs that he had put out as a bookseller of really high-end rare books. And uh, he knew that Hill, to his favorite customers, would send uh, a Christmas book each year. Vincent Sterrett then sat down and writes The Unique Hamlet, which is a story – mostly making fun of book collectors, talking about the unique Hamlet, which turns out to be a Hamlet quarto, so before the first folio, that uh, is the most desirable thing ever. And the, the man loses it and has to find Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to help solve the problem. So it's classic pastiche, said to be the best pastiche ever, written for the friends of Walter Hill, as a Christmas book, it was printed by the Torch Press in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, distributed to the uh, different way. Uh, Sterrett had his that he then distributed to who he thought was important, at least the first 10. And then from then on, it became a collectible. Um, it's been anthologized in pro possibly every way you could think of. And of course, you know, everybody from Queen's Quorum to Otto Penzler to Mystery Writers of America said it was the best pastiche ever. Now, you can argue that, but it is a pastiche, and it follows the classic pastiche, and it's just fun for a lot of reasons. Yeah, and those reasons, uh, you know, talk to the connection with book collecting. And part of the fun is that it is a great pastiche, but it also gently parodies some aspects of uh, Sherlockian 
the Sherlockian canon, the actions of Sherlock Holmes, the actions of Watson. But also, it, uh, as you pointed out, you know, it really um, has as its central motivation the craziness, the passion, the mania for book collecting. I agree. And, and uh, again, the, uh, in the Christmas annual, it's a multi author, uh, uh, work. And Ray Betzner, who is, you know, you've had on your show uh, as a collector of Vincent Sterrett and sort of a raconteur writes how this sort of, you know, mild burlesque of book collectors was adopted by the Sherlockians to be their pastiche and, and does a, a wonderful essay about it. And, and, and I'm so glad that Ray was able to write that for the Christmas annual. Hmm. And yet, you know, as I think you've, you've indicated both, you know, here and in the annual, um, Sterrett didn't write this for Sherlockians or at least not Sherlockians as we know them today. Uh, he, he wrote them, he wrote this for, uh, book collectors. Um, well, the, it, it was no doubt for book collectors. And let's be clear, Ray points out in 1920, there were no Sherlockians. The BSI didn't get started till the thirties. So 10 years before. Uh, but you know, it, it has that resonance that we all love it and, and it predates everything, but it's, you know, it's ours now. Yeah. <laughs> And, and just to underscore that for our listeners, somewhere in, um, the Christmas annual, the hundred year adventure of the unique Hamlet edited by Dick Sveam, um, it's mentioned, I think, that a copy of the unique Hamlet sold for as much as $38,000, making it the most expensive non Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes book in the world. If I'm, if I'm quoting that correctly, I don't know that I am. No, yeah, yeah, it is. It is without doubt the most expensive Sherlock Holmes story not written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And, uh, you know, it, it, to make sure that everybody understands the value of it, we've included the census. So as an appendix to Randall Stocks, the, you can see where they are. L- l- slowly, they're all ending up in institutions. There'll be very few amongst private collectors, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. And do you think the, the reason that so many of them are ending up in institutions is because of the, uh, the inflating price and the, uh, the, the smaller audience of collectors who might actually covet these? Or is there another reason? Well, um, I probably don't know, but I'm not shy to express an opinion. Uh, you know, uh, I've spent 20 years as the president of the Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collection at the University of Minnesota, and that grew up almost haphazardly, but, you know, they they picked up copies along the way. On the other hand, University of California, Berkeley, they got their copy because some big book collector, a big deal guy, had his books deposited there. And so they got it as part of his donation to the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, other ones, you know, got collected intentionally. You know, University of North Carolina, different places that have some Sherlockian collections. And I, I think by virtue of m- most high end book collectors, you know, you have, you always face this as a collector. You know, what are you going to do with your books when you die? I mean, anybody looks at my books and say, well, first, have you read all these? And I say, well, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and then what are you going to do with these books collections when you die? Well, you know, there's only a couple of choices. You know, they can either go back in the market and other people can sort of have at it. I can sort of, put them in an institution and I hope some of my books end up at the university of Minnesota, but I think you know the rest will be up to my heirs what they're going to do. See, I well, noticed that taking them with you is not, uh, still not around. Right, one, or, one or two volumes in the casket. But so. <laughs> now here's a question. If you had to pick one or two volumes for the casket, what no, uh, I, your heirs may I, be interested in this. What would you put in there? Would the unique yeah, Hamlet I, make it? Well, you know, I have, uh, I actually have a, a Doyle manuscript. How's that? That would be kind of, <laughs> well, take okay, that as this, is, this is becoming Desert Island Discs. So now you need a flashlight. <laughs> you need <laughs> a, a cell phone, cell phone, space for a manuscript, Wi Fi. Uh, getting complicated. 
Wow. Well, this is this is good information. And um, to to Dick's heirs, if you're listening, uh, you can reach us at comment at I hear of Sherlock dot com. Uh, we're always open to contributions. Um, we will be back just after this quick word from a sponsor to talk more with Dick's VM about the unique Hamlet. Stay tuned. Arthur Conan Doyle wrote 22 novels. The one he thought his best is an adventure story of knights and chivalry. 20-year-old Alan Edrickson travels the world, encountering bullies, con artists, thieves, a damsel in distress, and two men who become his closest friends. Together they join the White Company, archers and fighters led by the gallant Sir Nigel Loring. Will our hero win the hand of Loring's romantic daughter Maud? Will the chivalrous Prince Edward restore Peter of Castile to his Spanish throne? Published in 1891 and never out of print, The White Company is a tale of pageantry and piracy, heraldry and hope, published now in an exclusive, annotated edition with the original N.C. Wyeth illustrations in blazing color. Don't you owe it to yourself to read Conan Doyle's favorite book? Get the annotated White Company at wessexpress.com. Okay, we're back talking all things Vincent Sterrett's unique Hamlet with Dick Sviam. Um, so, Dick, but there's there's uh, a number of contributors to this volume. Of course, we mentioned uh, Randall Stock and his wonderful census. And we are trying to get Randall to come on the show at some point because he's just been such an important part of uh, the, the BSI manuscript series. His uh, website is fantastic. He has uh, taken over all of the technological aspects of the BSI. He'd be a fascinating interview. So uh, we're going to keep tracking him down. But in addition to Randall, uh, you mentioned Ray Betzner. Uh, we've had Ray on the show a couple of times before. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you were hoping to hear from Ray. Did, did you give him a specific assignment with respect to his contribution, or did you just let him have at it? Well, I, I did sort of mostly let him have at it because, um, you know, he, his fund of knowledge is enormous. He's got this website, Study and Starrett, who is like outstanding. And he's always coming up with new scholarship as re- regards Starrett. And so, you know, he, he, I, I, and I was just so pleased. He's such a good writer. You know, I, I always feel so humbled next to these good writers. And so it was fun to read his piece. We were uh, very honored to have Susan Rice. Now, Susan, uh, has now passed and, uh, I'm, it's honored that she was able to write this, uh, in, in a moment of, uh, of improved. She, you know, she was hesitant at first, but I'm so glad that she was part of this because Starrett meant so much to her. And so I feel like I've got, you know, with Susan Rice and Ray Betzner, we've got, you know, the really important Starrett people involved. Mm. Um, I got Julie McCurris to write to give us the sort of background of Christmas books and, and how that evolved from Christmas cards and that whole thing. I mean, not all Sherlockians are Christian, but the Christmas spirit is sort of secular part of what we're doing. And so that was good to have her right there. And then Michael Mears, you know, has a great story of the great, of the greatest of all the copies. He's got the greatest copy. So it's kind of, it was just fun to put it all together. And I'm thankful that Steve Rothman allowed me to do it because historically a lot of the, Christmas annuals are single or two authored affairs. I was honored to be part of the one last year for the Vincent, uh, for the Baron Gould. There was four of us that worked on that. Um, and, you know, if you look back at the original uh, Edgar Smith Christmas annual, that was a multi authored affair. So I we sort of made the story that this has to be multi authored. These people have to be involved. We probably want to have the script so people know what they're, they can read it and dis- make their own decision if it's the greatest uh, pastiche. And Steve was willing to accommodate all those requests on my part. Uh, you know, I, I made it years in advance, so he knew that 2020 was a critical thing. The only thing that sort of, it, in my mind, sort of took away from it was the fact that we couldn't meet in person to celebrate that we had this for the 100th anniversary. You know, we we're all stuck at home with the pandemic, but, you know, so it goes. Yeah. Well, a, a remarkable bit of planning on your part. I mean, if anything, it reminds me of... 
uh, a, a miniature version of one of the BSI Press books. You know, when you consider you've got a manuscript that you're working with, you're looking at a census and some of the uh, bibliographic details uh, regarding it. Uh, you've got multiple contributions. You've got the you know, kind of the central uh, theme that everyone's rallying around. Uh, it, it's it's a wonderful, you know, if I can put on my marketing hat for a moment, it's a wonderful uh, vehicle for exposing people to what they might be missing in a BSI Press kind of publication. Yeah, I mean, this could have easily been expanded into a full book, and we could have had all the textual analysis from manuscript to manuscript. But as a Christmas annual, I think it's just just about right. That's a good fit. And, you know, as it was a, a Christmas-themed or a Christmas gift, you know, from Starrett originally, as you said, um, how appropriate then. Mm. Mm. Dick, one of the many, well, several great essays in this book is yours, a book collecting Sherlock Holmes and... Vincent Starrett, um, particularly for our listeners who might not know much about Starrett, could you talk a little bit about your, um, your essay? But particularly why, you know, why are Sherlockians, what accounts for the affection and interest Sherlockians have, uh, with Vincent Starrett? Well, so Vincent Starrett, um, so his dates are 1886 and 1974. He was kind of the grand old man of uh, Sherlockians. And if you ever heard Ray Betzner talk about the private life of Sherlock Holmes, you realize how integral he was to putting this all together and that it was through that publication alone that we sort of created the BSI. And, and Vincent was able to be at the very first BSI dinner. He never attended another one ever and mostly stayed close to Chicago. Uh, but – he created the, the Hound of the Baskerville Sick there and continued sh- his interest in Sherlock Holmes. So, you know, he, he reviewed Arthur Conan Doyle. He, he corresponded with Arthur Conan Doyle. So he has a connection, if you will, to the literary agent. Uh, always honored the master with a lot of, a lot of writing. And, um, you know, I, I think that's what makes him so uh, lovable. Now, he also, uh, being an old journalist and then, turned writer, he wrote mystery series that's, you know, was popular at the time, but not much now. It's fun if you want to go back and read some of it. Otto Penzler just redid one of his early mysteries, and I encourage everybody to go back and read that. Uh, What I like as a book collector is is he wrote book columns in Chicago for all the newspapers, and he knew all the sort of authors. At the University of Minnesota, we have quite an archive of all of his correspondence with everybody imaginable. And that's really cool. Uh, you know, there was a, a Sherlockian named Charles Hans who wrote, who had Christmas books, do quite a few Christmas books, and he did the bibliography of Vincent Sterrett. So you could see, you know, understanding at early time, it, it was collectible. And then he had all these books on books, which, you know, if you want to read charming essays about it, it's just amazing that, you know, Pennywise, Book Foolish, uh, Book Column, you know, uh, it, 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 those are the ones that are underappreciated. And I tried to at least highlight that in my essay. My essay was kind of like, uh, you know, I thought of, get this, I thought of myself like Arthur Conan Doyle musing over my shelves, like uh, through the magic door saying, well, I have this third book and this third book and this one connects to this one. And, and, you know, it was, it was, it was attempt to do that. It wasn't very successful, but, you know, I thought that he had, he had uh, book collecting, he had book plates, he knew, uh, he was good friends with, Christopher Morley, he, you know, he, he had the very charming story of he, he, he was impoverished several times and had to give up his whole collections. And a, a, a Sherlockian named Logan Clendenning, a great guy, a physician, you know, wrote a column. He gave Starrett a whole collection, including a Beaton's Christmas annual to replace the collection that he had lost because he had ran out of money. I mean, talk about the ultimate friendship among Sherlockians. This was unbelievable. So I tried to at least hit the high points and talk about what what a great life he had and, and how he touched a lot of people. Well, and the, one of the lo- many lovely things in your essay, because you mentioned right towards the end, you know, you wanted to share your thoughts about books as Conan Doyle did in Through the Magic Door. But you quote Starrett, one of his uh, comments in Pennywise and Book Foolish in 1929, I have had more genuine happiness collecting books than in any other single transaction in my life. 
I, I, I live by that. That's, that's so cool. I mean, that's just pretty neat. Yeah. Now, the, the gesture that Logan Clendenning made to stare at, um, you know, I mean, it's the <laughs> kind of the, the epitome of GoFundMe, uh, for a book collector. Um, you know, not only replacing someone's collection, but, um, you know, doing it in such a grand fashion that included a, um, a Beaton's Christmas annual. Uh, I think that shows the degree to which, uh, you know, books and book collecting isn't just a solitary pursuit. I mean, we obviously can enjoy some of these things in the solitude of our own library, but ultimately it's what we do with them and, and how we get there that matters. And Sterrett, of course, was a friend to many and through his writing, uh, opened people up or opened, opened himself up to the rest of the world. Um, and, and Clendenning was willing to go the extra mile because of that way that Starrett built relationships. And based on your multiple collections, Dick, how would you say uh, you view uh, collecting and the pursuit and, and relationship building in that regard? Well, um, the, the, the fun thing about book collecting is, is actually to, to, to sort of share your enthusiasm. So the idea is you collect a book, you've been searching for a book, you find the book, and the best thing you can do is tell somebody about it. And that's what's the contagious part of fun. And so the bibliophilic societies allow me to do that for the non-Sherlockian books and the Sherlock Holmes groups allow me to do it within the Sherlockian world. And, you know, I, I, I value all the new scholarship, but it's fun to sort of dig back into the old. And so it's just so enjoyable. I mean, I'm doing it now full time having retired and it's just <laughs> endless enjoyment. Do you think that collecting today with um w- with the ease of finding things with the internet has detracted from the the process or or uh, eliminated some of those serendipitous friendships that may have occurred what, what's your view on the current status of the collecting well, so, environment um so a couple things uh i don't know if you know the story but terry ballinger was a sherlockian then he went off and at Columbia started the rare book school. And then I was able to chase him down and try to get him to re-engage the Sherlockians. And he came and addressed the BSI one year. And he told us that uh, buying a book online is not book collecting, it's shopping. But, you know, the Internet has allowed us to find things you'd never thought you'd see. And so that's pretty cool. So if you're looking for certain things, the Internet is uh, invaluable. To me, though, to actually get into a bookstore and see and touch the books is the really fun thing. I mean, I just have endless hours in bookstores, and it's really fun. In the pandemic, without a lot of that, I was able to wander around my own collection, feel like I was book shopping with them in my own collection. So that was enjoyable. Um, but, you know, think about some of the other young Shalakians. Rebecca Romney is a bookseller. And if you everybody heard her address to the Toronto Public Library, uh, where I'm fortunate to sit on their American Trust board, but you know it's it's outstanding. I mean, uh, Sherlockian book collecting is not dead. The internet hasn't changed it. There's uh, several unique collections within the world of Sherlock. You don't have to do the old. There's new. There's all kinds of stuff happening, and it's just endless. You know, one of my heroes was John Bennett Shaw. And John Bennett Shaw was noted for being a completist, and you know I have that tendency. If you want know, the hardcover, the paperback, the quality paperback, the first British, the colonial edition, you know, how many, how many copies do you need? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's like, it's impossible. I'm convinced it's impossible to be a completist now. There is so much going on that it's like impossible. You know, I, I try to buy as much as I can, especially even pastiches, which are the most ephemeral. They show up, they're around for a while and boom, they're gone. And there was a very big print run. And so, you know, you got to get them while you can. And so every time I see these things, I try to pick them up. Um, it's, it's fun. It's just, it's a, it's a part of Sherlockiana, but you know, it's that, that's my part of it that I so, so much enjoy. What do you think Vincent Sterrett would say if he were alive today and saw what we see. Well, so, so I, I think Vincent would be excited as all get out because 
he liked finding new authors and being excited by the writing. And, you know, he, he was such an avid reader. And then he would, something that he really enjoyed, he was able to pass on through his book columns about things he was interested in. And, and not only that, but he, you know, he, he, I can't imagine his, his files of correspondence is enormous. Can you imagine how much more he would have had if he had email? I mean, he would have been everybody all the time. And it was just, I, I think that's really fun. And he probably would have done well in the pandemic, just attending various Sherlockian society meetings <laughs> via Zoom. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's one way he could have finally made it back to the BSI dinner. Yeah, well, I think that. Hmm. So, I'm interested to see. You know, we're supposed to have a. We we at Minnesota we're very proud to say that since the 1990s we put on a conference every three years, and we're very proud and and we're planning to try to put one on in 2022. And the question is, you know, will things be open and ready for a big Minnesota conference in 2022? My fingers are crossed. I hope so, but we'll see. And of course, shortly thereafter, we're coming on to the 50th anniversary of the University of Minnesota Collections. 1974, it was founded. So 2024, get ready. Excellent. There's a, there's a lot still ahead in the world of Sherlock Holmes. That's great. Bert, any other questions? Yeah, let's talk just a little bit about Christmas. One of the lovely things in the... Christmas annual this year is Julie McCurris's essay about Christmas, which just does a lovely job. I mean, she begins, <laughs> she begins with the 1600s, you know, talking about, uh, the 1999 Grolier Club exhibition of Christmas books. Yeah, and, Jack Elliott's. Um, you know, the root and, and the origin of this. And it's one of the lovely things about the story of the unique Hamlet, because this takes us back to a time when, as you pointed out, Walter Hill could print a hundred copies of something as a Christmas token for his friends. Um, you know, I wish we still had those sort of printing economies. Uh, well, today. indirectly, we sort of do. I don't know if you're, if you're a, a customer of Otto Penzler and you buy stuff in December, you usually get, he commissions a story uh, of biblio mystery, something to do with the store. And, and he carries on the tradition. And I don't think it's as common, obviously, as it used to be, but there are still small remnants around. Yes, that's true. Well, Ben Otto is a master publisher and a master marketer. No, that's exactly right. But look, but talk a little bit about um, that because Julie's essay takes this, you know, through, um, Dickens, obviously, it takes us through um, A Christmas Carol, and we takes us up to 1919 and Vincent, who chose that year to write a Christmas fantasy. Have have you do you have a part of your collection around um, Christmas books or Christmas I, tokens? I do, I do. Um, so again, this is another one of those rabbit holes I fell into. Uh, Walter Klein Falter, a well known Sherlockian who's written several Sherlockian books, has written bibliographies of Christmas books. And so it's absolutely uh, interesting to me, especially with a lot of fine press and small press books, that he was able to have, uh, you know, a, a listing of all these Christmas books. I bought several, but not very much. I tried to get the Sherlockian ones. And, you know, the monologue in Baker Street was another Sher uh, Vincent Sterrett Christmas book that, you know, made it into the first Christmas annual. I mean, how cool is that? And uh, Friedolf Johnson, the guy that did his book plate with the Sherlockian head that we're so familiar with, you know, that he was the one who printed it when he lived in the Dakota in New York City. I mean, it's like, that's pretty cool. You have all these connections that just keep circling around. Um, Julie did an outstanding job. You know, it's also important that people be aware that Sherlock Holmes, A Three-Pipe Christmas, Dan Andriaco got... Blue Carbuncle, Unique Hamlet, and the Unique Dickensians and got essays. And Julie wrote in that and Susan Rice wrote in that. And so it's a, a book that uh, at least other Sherlockians should be aware of if they're into the Christmas part of it, which is fun. Yeah. Very hmm. much so. Yeah. Well, before we, we go, Dick, I think um, I wanted to pause for a moment about uh, – I think about – 
uh, one of the contributors uh, that you mentioned before, Susan Rice. Um, Susan left us all too soon uh, last year. And um, she's been on the show here a couple of times, once to talk with us uh, and Evie Herzog about the origins of the adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes, which is a, a great story. And she was uh, also with us once with Ray Betzner. Um, Bert, I, I, I think you remember that. We sat down at the players and, yeah. and a couch upstairs and talked with Susan and, and Ray. Um, Dick, tell us a little bit about why it was so important to have Susan involved with this project. Well, I mean, part of my understanding of Vincent Starrett comes from Susan and Susan's writings and, and, you know, the Psalm ambulist. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, I, I consider Susan and Mickey good friends, able to attend their wedding. It was very exciting. And, you know, I've been after Susan that she needs to write something about this and, you know, she was hesitant at first. She finally consented. And I was just so pleased and put it in a place of honor right after the story. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't, it, to, to honor Stuart without Susan, Susan would have been incomplete. And so I think that's why it was so valuable that we were able to do that. And did, do you recall if she gave you a reason for her hesitancy? Oh, yeah, I think that with her illness, she didn't feel like she was able to write as well. You know, she was an outstanding writer. And if she felt like she was slipping some, I think she was cautious about that. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, Susan Mickey, uh, if you've ever been to their place in New York, they had lots and lots of books. And Susan kept insisting that she was not a collector. She had accumulated quite a bit, but she was not a collector. And, you know, I think that she always looked down a little bit at me because I was sort of a maniac collector and didn't have the fund of knowledge that she had. But, and she was such a good writer. Well, Miss Susan. We do. But uh, how fortunate we are to have gotten this contribution from her. As I, I would imagine this is probably her last major Sherlockian uh, sc- bit of scholarship. I think so. Wow. Well, what an honor. And what a treat it is for the rest of us who uh, who have a copy. So, um, well, the unique Hamlet um, one, celebrating 100 years of this uh, this fine publication, a 100 year anniversary of the unique Hamlet. That's the title of the 2020 Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual. This is now a collector's item, maybe not on the order of, of, a, of a unique Hamlet itself, but still something well worth having as part of your collection. Uh, Dick, thank you so much for speaking with us and uh, we hope you'll come back and, and talk about other uh, areas of collecting uh, at some point in the future. I'm sure we could we could mine the depths of your mind and your basement for quite a while. I'd be glad to. Thank you for inviting me. Dick is such a great example of. A a Baker Street irregular, but also of a scholar and also of a book collector. You know, he is a real exemplar. And I love that comment that he made about um, the joy of book collecting. You know, as soon as you find something that you've discovered, that you've uncovered, that you've been pursuing, that you finally have in your hands, you know, what's your first instinct to tell somebody about it? You know, it's that, it's that community. It's that sharing of like-minded uh, interests that really sort of defines, I mean, you know, the Baker Street Irregulars didn't begin at all as a, as a book collecting kind of a group, but it describes really the spirit of being able to share something we all have this, this common interest in. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is why I think it was so much fun to do what we did back on episode 207, uh, where we did the live video stream, uh, that we just, picked out a number of items from our collections and did a show and tell. Uh, we don't get to do that much. Uh, it, well, you certainly don't get to do it in typical Sherlockian society meetings. Um, you get to do it when someone comes over to your house or when you're maybe when you're invited to bring a specific item and talk about it at uh, a gathering. But to be able to share as much as we did uh, in the way that we did, that was uh, that was fascinating. And mm. you get a sense from somebody like Dick with 40,000 <laughs> books in his collection uh, that it is like a small bookstore or a library. 
uh, you could spend a lifetime there uh, and and get so much joy uh, from him and the stories he tells and the way things were acquired and the people he met along the way uh, that a collection itself is not just a collection of books and papers. It's a collection of stories. Yeah, well said. Have you noticed that the direct-to-consumer market has made it easier than ever to get items you love delivered to you on a regular basis? It could be a monthly subscription to a newspaper, laundry detergent, or razor blades. And you can depend on getting what you need without fail every month. Well, what if you could do the same thing with Sherlock Holmes books? That's exactly what MX Publishing has introduced, the Sherlock Holmes Book Club. With their monthly subscription, you'll be able to get a regular delivery of volumes from the MX Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories. Fans can choose from a monthly subscription or a full year up front for a small discount. If you're planning on reading any of the new Sherlock Holmes stories from MX Publishing, this is an affordable and reliable way to get your fix. Just go to ihose.co slash mxbookclub and sign up today. That's all lowercase, ihose.co slash mxbookclub. Try it this month. Well, that music means it's time for a collection of conundra. That's the plural of conundrum. Am I, am I correct in thinking that? <laughs> when we do our canonical couplet. That's right. It's everyone's favorite quiz show where we give you two lines of poetry and you have to identify which story we are referring to. Now, if you remember, the last time around, we varied things a little bit where we did an alternative title to a canonical story. Now, we gave you the title, The Barber of Hampshire. The Barber of Hampshire. And, Bert, do you know which Sherlock Holmes story that was referring to? Oh, yes, that was very easy. That is the case of the very old, mean burglar uh, who was serving... 10 years in prison. That's the adventure of the jailed codger. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no. That's, that's the best I can do in that case. So that's not correct. Um, the, the answer we were looking for uh, was the adventure of the copper beaches. Oh, no. Because of course that was located in Hampshire and uh, Violet Hunter had to cut her hair quite short. I will say, uh, once again, Eric Deckers came through for us. He said, since it's the barber of Hampshire, it sounded like the retelling of Warner Brothers' Rabbit of Seville, but starring Porky Pig and the angry redhead Yosemite Sam. Uh, that meant that this was the adventure of the five orange pigs. <laughs> Eric, a valiant effort, almost as valiant as Bert, or Valium laden as Valium. Bert's. Yeah. So, well, um, we did have a number of correct answers of the Copper Beaches. So what we're going to do now is bring the big prize wheel out and give it a big spin. And we watch the wheel go around and around, slowing down and landing on number 28. 28. It's always a favorite number of mine in roulette. And in this case, it actually corresponds to Bruce Harris. Bruce, congratulations. We will be in touch with another fine prize. I think this time around we, we gave you, uh, or we are giving you a copy of Performing Arts. Uh, with the Crucifer of Blood insert there. So uh, that will be fantastic. Well, this time around, as we indicated in the interview with Dix VM, we have an extra copy of the 2020 BSJ Christmas Annual. 
the 100-year adventure of the unique Hamlet. And this will be our prize this time around with this clue. At 6 a.m. near Aldgate Station, Masons Finding Alarmed the Nation. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct entries and we choose you at random, you'll win this prize. Good luck. Oh, I hope we get a lot of contributions this time around. Um, oh, we, we really we want to find a good home for this Christmas annual. So particularly if you are not a subscriber of the Baker Street Journal and you would like to uh, make good on your error last year of missing out on this Christmas annual, this is the opportunity. So again, email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Put canonical couplet in the title, and we hope you do well on that. Well, Bert, anything more on this post-Valentine's Day episode? No, no, I'm just sitting here mopping up the little circles on the leather coasters from the champagne bottles huh. and trying to pick the last of the chocolate off of my mustache. Well, and I will be over here uh, picking up all of the rose petals that have been scattered about as our little flower girl has uh, come through the house and strewn them about. In the meantime, we will see you back here next time, a little earlier than usual, because this is February, after all, and we do not have a 30th of this month. Uh, in the meantime, I will be the extra short Scott Monty. And I'm the uh, practically disappearing Burt Wolder. And together, we say... The, the games, games of foot. foot. <laughs> the, the games, games of foot. foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>